Hi. How are you? Hi, Trish. I'm good, thank you. How are you? Please, may you introduce yourself and tell us what you do? So, my name is Glanis Changachirere. Um, I work with the Institute for Young Women Development, uh, where I'm the team leader, and I founded this organization in 2009. I identify as a feminist and a, an activist, and every day within the Institute, my job is to actually fight for the rights of young women so that they are able to have access to economic resources, they are actually able to participate in public processes and to also be represented, which means they also need to offer themselves as candidates and be elected into office from community level up to you know, national levels. And then I also ensure that um, our organization um, really mobilizes young women, especially those who are in marginalized communities, you know, including rural farming uh, and mining communities. Okay, do you have a role model and who are they? Definitely, I do have role models. Uh, I have role models in my community where I come from, um, and I also have role models at a national level as well as globally. So in my community, really, the role models I have are the women that I work with, whom I have seen, you know, walk through a journey of leadership, of transformation, and they continue to inspire me, you know, the fact that their lives changed through the work that we do. I actually look up to them as people who are, you know, the, the, the evidence, you know, uh, the models of the change that we aspire to see in our community. And then at a national level, I, I really, you know, derive a lot of inspiration from a lot of women, especially from the feminist movement in Zimbabwe. Uh, talk of Lucy Mazengi, talk of Bella, Isabella, Matambanazo, Eva Joyce Wynn, you know, Tokomache, Hope Chigudu, there are quite a, a number of them. And um, at a global level, I think my, my inspiration really comes from one of the most prominent feminists, you know, from the US, uh, a black African-American called I, I, Maya Angelou. Um, I, I derive a lot of uh, ins inspiration from her, as well as Audrey Lode, who is um, a feminist scholar and you know theorist who also talks a lot about the lives of women. In your opinion, is it important to have outstanding women to look up to? Definitely, there is need to have models that you can look up to and say, okay, this is what I aspire to be. And then you look at their journey and say, how did they work it? so that you also uh, energize and inspire your own journey and really be able to be in a position to actually you know, follow that path and achieve what you want to achieve in life. Okay, why is it important to amplify the work of the feminist movement? It's very important because um, feminists are working to change societies so that they respect the rights of women, they make sure that there is equality you know, in terms of opportunities, access to resources, um, for women. So the women's, the feminist movement or rather women's movements across uh, the world therefore need to actually, you know, um, exist so that this work is done and it's achieved. Otherwise, without the movements, um, it will be difficult for us to have the change that we want to see for the good of women. Okay. In what way do you think campaigns like 16 Days Against Gender-Based Violence can help end violence? Um, so campaigns play multiple roles, uh, you know, they raise awareness for communities, for women to actually know that gender-based violence exists, uh, for them to be able to, you know, identify it when they see it happening, as well as uh, also provides, you know, uh, the opportunities for people to actually take action in order to contribute towards ending gender-based violence. What color is associated with this campaign? <laughs> so this year it's, uh, it's orange. Actually, it's not this year. It's, it's the United Nations adopted color um, or theme for the 16 days against um, activism, uh, 16 days uh, of activism against gender-based violence over the years. Uh, you know, they've been really emphasizing that we need to orange the, the world when it comes to uh, campaigning um, against gender-based violence. What is the theme for this year? So there are multiple themes. The United Nations, they've got a theme that they have and the, the 16 days campaign itself also have got a theme. Um, so in our organization, we've been using the campaign from the, the theme from the 16 days campaign, which is from awareness to accountability. This is quite profound for us this particular year because 2021 marks 30 years of, um, you know, campaigning for an end to gender-based violence. And to us, Yes, we have done a lot of work in terms of raising awareness and we are at a point where we actually need to ask 
ourselves, you know, different stakeholders, our governments, where we are actually getting it wrong or where we need to do more in order to have accountability on how we can improve our work in order to actually end gender-based violence. Because as you can see, it's 2021, but gender-based violence is still very much prevalent. And it's even worse in the context of a disaster like COVID-19. So being able to hold each other accountable actually provides for opportunities to deepen the conversation and work around ending gender-based violence. Okay. What does this theme mean to you? you, you and Pretty much what I have said, you know, we need to go beyond awareness raising to also start holding each other accountable in terms of where we need to improve, you know, uh, which actors also need to improve and contribute towards this cause. Because from my work, I actually realized that much of the work around ending gender-based violence is given as a burden or a responsibility of women, which is not the case. Ending gender-based violence should be a collective action by anyone and everyone in society, including governments. So we need to be able to hold everyone accountable on what part they are playing and what they need to do, you know, to improve uh, in order to really end gender-based violence. So why 16 days? Well, um, I have seen a lot of actors adopt, you know, 365 days of activism against gender-based violence. But I still love and respect the idea of 16 days because I think for me what that means is it allows us to dedicate time, you know, within the 365 or sometimes 366 days of the year to like really focus everything again uh, around um, fighting against gender-based violence. So for me, the 16 days, uh, which of course, you know, cover the period from when we start um, you know, uh, recognizing the day of the elimination of all forms of violence against women, which starts on the 25th, all the way, you know, to the International Human Rights Day on the 10th of, on the 10th of December. This period, you know, really accords us to look at how uh, the issue of gender-based violence is not an isolated issue, but it actually interlinks and intersects with other issues that we fight for as human rights defenders and also as activists acro across the globe. Who should participate in 16 days of... Everyone must be involved in the campaign against 16 days. Uh, and I think it should not just, you know, start and end as, an, as a campaign. Everyone must participate in actively doing something to end gender-based violence. So it's, it's the young women, it's the women, it's the youth, it's the men, it's the, you know, different... Uh, demographic groups that we have in our society but it's also different arms of government and different institutions at a national level as well as at a regional and global level everyone has got a responsibility to take part in meaningfully contributing towards ending gender-based violence against women what forms of gbv do you know there are multiple forms of gender-based violence um, that society and, and, and um, you know, our communities experience. I say society and community because I also acknowledge that while the highest number of people or the highest population affected by gender-based violence are women and girls, men can also sometimes, um, you know, experience gender-based violence as well as, you know, people of different sexual orientation as well. They also experience, you know, uh, gender-based violence. But, um, you know, the most common ones really are the physical violence that people, you know, um, experience, psychological, e emotional violence, economic violence, um, and yeah, it goes on and on. There are really different forms uh, of violence. And, and even now, you know, in the current moment, I think one of the things we're also recognizing is that there is violence that people perpetuate without realizing that they are actually contributing towards gender-based violence. So we really need to be able to surface some of those nuances and also be able to categorize those different forms that sometimes cannot be associated uh, with the different forms that I've talked about, but yet they are actually, you know, forms of violence violations that I experienced. Okay, would you say there's been progress made since 1991? Certainly. Certainly a lot of progress has been made in terms of um, raising awareness and having certain actions, you know, taken to end violence against women. I think for starters, when I look at Zimbabwe and maybe the African continent at large, it's the recognition of gender-based violence is an issue of concern for national governments and for global governments. And then number two, it has been the awareness also, you know, put into the communities uh, that we come from, you know, for people to just recognize that 
gender-based violence is actually a reality and it affects a lot of people. Um, and it's also, you know, a number of, you know, part of the progress comes, uh, you know, through a number of policies that have been made um, and laws that have been put in place to really, you know, end gender-based violence. I think in Zimbabwe, you know, we do have the Domestic Violence Act that was put in place in 2019, uh, sorry, in 1997. That is, you know, um, one of the biggest milestones that we have. And over time, you know, the laws have continued to actually uh, improve. We've got laws around inheritance. We also have got, you know, um, um, laws that also recognize, you know, women of a certain age group or people of a certain age group is people who actually need to be protected from gender-based violence. So they are different, um, you know, there are many, many uh, milestones that have actually been achieved. And I think it's worth celebrating uh, as we mark 30 years uh, anniversary of the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence campaign. What, would, what one thing would you want to say to the group that started this campaign? There are many things I want to say to them, but because this you're one. asking for one thing, <laughs> um, we really sh stand on the shoulders of those women who carved this way for us to be able to talk about gender-based violence in this moment and even continue to unpack the different forms as they affect you know, different groups of, of young women, of girls, of women, of youth in our society. We really, really appreciate um, the effort and commitment that they have made. Do you feel that after 30 years, significant progress has been made through the campaign? Definitely. I think I've spoken to that in terms of, you know, awareness, recognition of, you know, GBV as a pandemic on its own, um, the laws, the, 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 the policies that have been put in place, not only in Zimbabwe, but actually across different uh, countries on the continent as well as internationally. Uh, can GBV be prevented or eradicated? It certainly can be prevented. Um, but I think where we are at the present moment, we need to actually focus more around eradication. And once we have managed to eradicate, then we can continue to prevent as a way of sustaining the eradication. So yeah, it can definitely be prevented and eradicated. Okay, has the pandemic um, here, the COVID pandemic, has it affected GBP in any way? Certainly, um, the pandemic has really depend you know, um, the impact of gender-based violence as well as the different forms of, ge of gender-based violence. And I think while it has been bad, you know, um, for everyone, the pandemic has also, you know, um, kind of like helped um, get everyone to really appreciate what activists, human rights defenders and feminists have always been saying around, you know, um, the depth and impact of gender-based violence in our lives and well, as well as in our communities. I think right now everyone is clearly seeing, you know, the, the, the teen pregnancies that are, you know, um, rising each and every single day, high levels of sexual violence against girls and young women and women, um, you know, the deepening inequalities even in terms of, you know, um, access to economic resources and opportunities within the current context. I think that all that is, has been amplified, you know, by the, the pandemic. What one challenge uh, do you face in fighting DBV? So I, I think for us, uh, the major challenge is the assumption that gender-based violence is a responsibility for women. Uh, so women's rights activists, feminists and women's rights organizations are the ones that are expected, you know, to take a leading role in fighting against gender-based violence. That is very problematic because it kind of like, you know, alienates everyone else from being responsible, from actually doing actions that contribute towards preventing or eradicating uh, gender-based violence, and also, you know, from, you know, being held accountable. So that is really a big, a big challenge um, for us. Uh, what, do you, what do you think needs to be done to increase or raise more awareness on GBV? Um, it's to continue, you know, with uh, the actions that we are doing now, um, you know, using media to talk a lot about it, engaging with communities, you know, um, 
including in the grassroots communities, in the rural areas, in the farming areas, in the mining communities, high density suburbs, uh, you know, peri urban communities, even in the affluent suburbs, because a lot of violence is also coming, you know, from places that are usually considered privileged. So that awareness raising needs to continue. But I think from 31 years going forward, which, is, which means from next year going forward, we actually need to do more of accountability, seeking accountability from different um, actors, but in particular also looking at how governments are actively contributing towards uh, you know, ending gender-based violence. Because when you look at what we're experiencing right now, um, violence in the communities can may be reducing as a result of the awareness raising, but it's then continuously perpetuated by the systematic kind of uh, you know, actions that governments take. Like in our context, there is heavy militarization. This is not only in Zimbabwe. You go to Swaziland right now. You go to Ethiopia right now. You go to Sudan. This is the situation. And that continues to perpetuate gender-based violence. So we need to really hold these governments accountable in terms of uh, the actions that they are taking. What has been your mis most memorable high uh, when raising awareness against gender-based violence? Um, I think for me as somebody who works with grassroots communities, especially in rural areas, my aha moment has been having been able to influence traditional leaders in particular, given that they are custodians of culture. And in our culture, there are harmful practices, cultural practices that are respected, but they're actually harmful and they are part of what is used to actually perpetuate gender-based violence. So being in a position, you know, to have traditional, to raise awareness to traditional leaders, but also to actually have them to buy into the campaign and being able to speak out against gender-based violence in their communities, I think for me has been the biggest achievement. Where can people who experience gender-based violence get help? There are different spaces that provide support, um, you know, to survivors of gender-based violence. Uh, I know in Zimbabwe there are places like Musasa where one can go as a way of, you know, trying to seek um, shelter. Um, to seek refuge, to run away from the place where the violence is happening. Uh, but there are also places that offer psychosocial support uh, in the, at the Institute for Young Women Development. That is also one area that we are quite strong um, around, where we provide psychosocial support that is uh, feminist, non-judgmental, but really seek to look at, uh, to provide holistic support to women. There are also places where, uh, you know, people can go especially in the case of, you know, sexually um, motivated um, gender-based violence. If you are raped, you can go to the adult rape clinic. And if you also just want advice, you know, approaching any of the women's rights organizations that we have in this country, they will be able, you know, to, you know, connect the survivors to the different uh, referral pathways for, you know, um, you know support around gender-based violence. How best can society assist with fighting against gender-based violence? We all need to own the responsibility to end gender-based violence at a personal level, at a family level, community, national level, regional, global. Everyone needs to take responsibility and hold each other accountable. Hold yourself to account. You know, the actions that you do, um, are you not contributing towards gender-based violence, be it economic, you know, uh, politically motivated gender-based violence, uh, physical violence, sexual violence. We need to actually internalize the need for us to stop, you know, gender-based violence for the good of everyone in our society. So everyone must take responsibility. What does one need to do if they want to join the fight against gender-based violence? Um, start by being part of the campaign. Recognize the existence of gender-based violence. Um, once you've recognized it is, you know, a phenomenon that we all need to tackle, then take an action, you know, to end gender-based violence. You can raise awareness to people around you, your inner circle, the people you associate with, even at work. Um, also take actions, you know, meaningful actions. When somebody is involved in uh, gender-based violence, be they perpetrators or survivors, you need to take an active role to bring to book the perpetrators, but also to support, you know, the survivors uh, or the victims of the gender-based violence. So being able to offer the self and say, I want to do something, I think is the 
starting point to everyone who wants to contribute towards eradicating this pandemic. Building on that, what can one do if they know a victim of gender-based violence? Approach any women's rights organization, or if you don't know of any women's rights organization in your area, you can actually approach the Ministry of Women's Affairs. Um, it's also part of their responsibility, and I know in different provinces, the Ministry of Women's Affairs runs what are called um, one-stop centers, you know, for survivors of gender-based violence. So you can be able to approach the ministry. They work with different ward coordinators, which means their representatives are in the very communities where we come from. Uh, if we can't, you know, identify where to or locate the ministry representatives or the ministry itself, at least go to a nearest clinic. And, and say that you know about a survivor of gender-based violence, go to the nearest police station, ask for the victim-friendly unit, and they can be able to support you in terms of how you can continue to support the people that you continue to see experiencing gender-based violence. Does your organization have a policy on gender-based violence? Certainly we do. Uh, it's one of the things that we put in place in 2014 when we're reviewing our policies because we realized that since our foundation in 2009 uh, up to 2014 we did not have a specific gender-based uh, gender policy um, that also looks at tackling gender-based violence um, of course we did have elements in our human resources policy you know which talks about the code of conduct but it was very broad you know so we really needed to have something that is more detailed specific as well as, um, you know, something that is quite comprehensive in terms of recognizing the different complexities in which, uh, you know, gender-based violence happen in an organization like ours. So, yes, we do have a policy now. Okay. Has the policy helped, in your opinion? It has a lot, uh, because it's the policy that we apply to the staff members, um, but also we apply it in the communities where we go, including, you know, our our inclusion of you know traditional leaders it's actually a uh, part and parcel you know of that gender policy to say that who are the different actors how should we engage with them how should we hold them to account in terms of how they relate with you know young women and women uh, that we work with in the communities that you know they reside so it's 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 helped in 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 many different ways and i think it has also even contributed towards our policy advocacy you know the different policies that we are advocating to be put in place at a national level, you know, are a result of, you know, our experience um, implementing our gender-based uh, violence policy in communities where we work with women and young women. Okay, how are you raising awareness this year? So this year we had a lot of activities um, that we are doing, uh, well, that actually end today, um, the 10th of December. But since the beginning, uh, I think one of the flagship activities we have done has been to come up with, you know, a documentary more like a film um, of 16 short stories of women's experiences with gender-based violence. Uh, which is titled Ndafunga Kure, um, which is a production that we've come up with, you know, in collaboration with uh, Southern African Parliamentary Support Trust, as well as the Zimbabwe Coalition for Debt and Development, uh, ZIMCOD. Um, and we decided to come up with, you know, this uh, collaboration because we were all running three different campaigns. So for us, our flagship, uh, you know, theme for for 16 days has been what women want because we want to hold accountable different actors on what women want in order to end violence against women. So we then uh, also sought to build on, you know, looking at the He for She campaign, which is being run by SAPST uh, together with parliamentarians and also combine it with what um, Zimcot is doing to hold the government accountable across the different uh, you know, sectors of life, which is called the How Far, How Far Campaign. So we were running with you know, uh, more like a you know, um, combination of, we are asking he for she, we are asking how far to he for she on what women want. Um, and so that is expressed in the different um, you know, 16 stories that we have come up with. And these stories were being published one on each day from you know, the 25th of November and the last one is actually being screened again um, 
today. In addition, we've been doing a lot of community awareness raising as well as accountability platforms with different you know, stakeholders. So young women that we work with have been going into communities, you know, mobilizing women, you know, youth, men, and raising awareness around gender-based violence. But within you know, the people that they mobilized, they also you know, brought in different representatives from government, Minister of Youth, Minister of Women's Affairs, um, the Zimbabwe Youth Council, traditional leaders, uh, you know, different actors and, you know, just uh, seeking accountability in terms of what they are also doing to end gender-based violence. Do you have more activities planned uh, for beyond the 16 days period? So when you look at our work broadly as the Institute for Young Women Development, it's really work that targets at ending the structural nature of gender-based violence. Uh, where we recognize that the different inequalities that we have in society between young women and, and, and young men, between you know women and young women, between women and men, are the roots of the different forms of gender-based violence you know that people then experience in different forms. So definitely that's the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, raising awareness, building critical mass of young women who are actually able to act in order to end violence that they experience themselves and also violence that ha happens in their communities to demand access to economic resources to demand access you know to decision making spaces because these are also platforms that make the laws and the policies that i was talking to as being essential to the broader campaign so yeah definitely it's work that we're going to continue and uh, continues to happen but our entry point really is to tackle the structural nature of gender-based violence does the state have a role to play in fighting gen uh, against gender-based violence? Definitely, definitely. Um, governments have got a role to play in ending gender-based violence. I think for starters, even the awareness raising, you know, it's work that we anticipate the government uh, to actually also do because different people in different communities listen to different voices. And when governments ride on what civil society and women's rights organizations are doing, then definitely that can be, you know, um, that contribute towards amplifying the calls to end violence against women. But most importantly, they need to make policies, implement them in the letter and spirit of the policies and the laws that are aimed at ending gender-based violence. And that's where we actually need to hold them accountable to say, what are you doing? What policies and laws have you put in place? Are you implementing them in the letter and the spirit of those policies and legislative pieces? And if they are not, we really need to call them out and ask them you know, to be accountable to that. So they have a big role actually, especially when it comes to tackling the structural nature of gender-based violence. Uh, any quick message to young women? Um, yeah, you know, just to say that let's not normalize violence, uh, gender-based violence in particular, and say, you know, this is part of our culture. It's, violence is never part of anyone's culture. So we need to be able to recognize violence as it happens. We need to speak out. We need to seek support before it gets too late. So, yeah, let's all be, you know, critical voices in the fight against um, gender-based violence. Thank you, Glennis. You're welcome.